For the past several years, I've had the opportunity of doing a monthly special teaching for those who support this ministry, who have helped us get the gospel of the kingdom that Yeshua taught out to the nations of the world. I've had the opportunity of taking more than two years and going through every incident in the life and ministry of Yeshua in the monthly love gift, which is covering Yeshua's ministry. I have also taken the supporters through the book of Acts. And getting into great detail on this is I'm only able to do for those who really are desiring to know the truth, who are not just watching YouTube on a, on a whim, but who really want to know and really want to study and be diligent uh, to know uh, the scriptures and how they all fit together. Now, with this app, this Michael Rood TV app, I have the opportunity of getting together with you in, in my home, so to speak. People ask me, and they've asked me for years when I was living in Israel and now in the United States, what congregation do I attend? And really, the, my favorite congregation is always the one that meets in my home. And it's different every week, and it's different uh, depends on where we are in the world uh, to, to get together just face-to-face, one-on-one or one-on-30 or 50. And uh, in, in Israel, I spent five months, 70 hours, going through every single word of the Gospels from the King James Version of the Bible and then correcting it as necessary according to the ancient text. And I did this with an audience, a, a, an interactive audience of people who had been missionaries their entire lives, who had been students of the Bible for a, a lifetime, who were fluent in Hebrew, in Greek, in Spanish, in, in Russian. And they, they all came together and we, we had a special guests that came in just about every week, people who would come in from around the world. Uh, they would come into Jerusalem and they would travel up to the Galilee to be there for uh, the Shabbat get together. And it was hours. I, I would spend about five hours uh, taking them into the gospels. And that is where I first put together the entire gospel record uh, with all of these people to challenge to make sure that I covered every incident, every question that came up from their Bibles and their translations, and then bringing it all into a, a, a complete picture of more than 300 incidents in the life and ministry of Yeshua. It would be several years from that point uh, before I would actually publish the chronological gospels because I was doing it for myself and for my desire to be able to communicate the life and ministry of Yeshua in context and to understand the gospel of the kingdom that he was teaching because everything Yeshua taught everything he did, every confrontation with the Pharisees, with the Zadokim, every single incident is an example of the gospel of the kingdom. It's not just a simple statement. It's not just the death, burial, and resurrection. No, it, it is the totality of the gospel of the kingdom that I had been searching for since I was 17 years of age. And by the time I had fit, hit 50 years of age, I knew then that I was beginning to understand the gospel of the kingdom, beginning to understand. And it's been a journey since that time. Now, I would like to invite you into my home, so to speak, and to experience what I experienced a short time ago. The fellowship that was meeting at my home, the, it, the people were from several different backgrounds. We had pastors, we had uh, ministers, we had people that, that came from the Catholic background, from the Episcopalian, uh, from all sorts of, of different denominations. And it was there one evening that a couple of people spoke up and said that they really missed the creeds 
the creeds that they used to say in church, that now church services have become so so seeker-friendly that there's no Bible that's really being taught. There is no creeds that are being spoken. And when these words were spoken about the creeds, this has never been a part of my experience at all, reciting creeds. But then they went on to explain how that these creeds were the, the things that they agreed on. These were the tenets. These were the basic principles of which we as believers agree on and we are speaking these things out and then people understand what this faith is that we're talking about. And as Paul said, and, uh, and of course in Judas says to earnestly contend for the faith once delivered to the saints because the faith once delivered to the saints had been seriously eroded before the death of the Apostle Paul. And so I desire to get back to that faith that was once delivered to the saints, the faith of the Jewish apostles. As they begin to learn, as Yeshua instructs them by the Spirit, how the gospel of the kingdom is to be taken out into the entire world. He said to begin at Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and then to the uttermost part of the earth. And so as they began to learn this and then the gospel of the kingdom went out to the Gentiles and then we see that uh, the Gentiles caught on with much more fervor than what we see happening in the Jewish synagogues but then the Gentiles started adding in their pagan sun god worship baggage into where it all got mixed in in the time of Constantine to where the faith once delivered to the saints no longer exists. And, and so this concept of these creeds took me back to a, a time in Jerusalem a quarter of a century ago and I wanna share this with you. I was sitting inside a Jaffa gate on a stone bench with a person who became a good friend, Shemer Levan. Shemer Levan was uh, at one time a, a very successful chiropractor in Michigan who he and his wife and children, his family, and an extended group of about 20 people, they wanted to go back to the ancient paths, as, it, as the prophet said. Go back to the ancient paths to understand the Bible in its context. And so they moved to Israel. They then went out and lived among the Bedouins and literally lived in a Bedouin tent with the Bedouins for nine months. They learned to sew their own clothes using linen and, and making ancient biblical clothing and they spent nine months with the Bedouins and then they said, we've got to get out of here because the Bedouins were running generators to charge their cell phones and their televisions. And they said, no, we, we need to get out further. And so they continued to go back deeper and deeper into the ancient paths, but they did learn things along the way of how to cook on an ancient saj, an ancient biblical oven, uh, and how to live off the land, how to uh, saddle up and, uh, and burden a camel and to travel by way of camel and to travel up to the feast at Jerusalem three times a year by walking up with a donkey and with sometimes with the entire family. Other times it was just the men that went up. Uh, depends on the time of the year, whether it was so hot and the children really wouldn't be able to handle the heat of traveling to Jerusalem or not. And so it was that experience that they experienced that I was invited into. And I spent many times uh, the, the feast going up to Mount Gerizim, at the base of Mount Gerizim, Har Bracha, the Mount of Blessing, as it is called, and right at the base of that mountain where the Samaritan Temple was, this is where Shemer and his family lived. And I would come up to Jerusalem for the feast, year after year, and either before the feast or after the feast, I would then go up to Mount Gerizim, 
uh, right up near Nablus, Neapolis, uh, also a- ancient uh, Shechem. And there it is that I would, would uh, fellowship with them and I would learn what they were learning. In one year, a miraculous event happened where I was invited, uh, as I was sitting on the porch of, of Shemer, I was then invited into the home of the high priest of the Samaritans for the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles because their calendar was a couple of days off, and so uh, the Feast of Tabernacles was not yet according to the biblical calendar in Jerusalem. And so on the Samaritan calendar, I was invited into the home of the high priest of the Samaritans, and that is what unlocked the great treasures that I learned from the Samaritans and unlocking the very incident of Yeshua meeting the Samaritan woman at the well which I, I recently covered in one of the love gifts. And, and with this uh, uh, event of, of living with them, and, and uh, Shemer's wife was the one who first made my first set of biblical garments, my white linen garments that were all hand sewn. Uh, and later on, uh, Reuven Prager of Begadivri in Jerusalem, a, a Levite, uh, he and his, uh, his team would make my garments. Then Sammy Barsom, who was the Mukhtar, the, uh, the mayor of the Syrian Orthodox community in Jerusalem, uh, he would make them. And so, you know, I, I got to be engaged with, with all these different people, all these different groups while I lived in Israel for those 20 years, which became indispensable in my understanding and being able to put together the Gospels. Now, I wanna take you uh, to back to that stone bench inside a Jaffa Gate with Shemar Levan more than a quarter of a century ago. And as he was sitting there in his biblical garments and I was uh, engaged in deep conversation with him, a, uh, an Orthodox Jew came by and, and stopped and said, are you Jewish to him? And he said, no, I'm not. He said, are you a Christian? He said, I believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, but I don't follow any of the pagan practices of, church, uh, of Christianity. And with that, the man sat down and that conversation went on for two hours. Now, what he wanted to do, what this Orthodox Jew wanted to do is like all people want to do. They wanted to put this man, Shemar Levan, in a box that they could define, and then once they have him in the box, then they could dismiss him. But when Shomer answered in, in that way, no, I'm not Jewish, and asked if he is a Christian, he said, I believe Yeshua is the Messiah, but I don't follow any of the pagan practices of Christianity. At that point, the man could not put him in a box. And I learned something very important on that at that time, is that all men want to put you in a box, a box so they can dismiss you. Years later, people asked me, they demanded that I put a statement of faith on our website. And I knew what they wanted to do. I'd learned it many years before. They wanted me to define the box so that they could either accept the whole box or they could reject it. And I, knowing this, I refused to make a statement of faith that they wanted, but I made a statement of faith, and this was the statement of faith, and it still is my statement of faith. This is a precursor of what I'm going to be sharing with you over the next several weeks, maybe months, as the New Apostles' Creed. And this is how it started out, and this is the sum total of the statement of faith that I put up at that time. God is, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I felt that that was in total 
my directive and my statement of faith, this is how I governed my life. When I was in second grade and began questioning how you get three days and three nights between Good Friday and Easter Sunday morning and did not and could not get a, a reasonable answer for a second grader from my pastor or for anyone, that set me on a course. It was something that bothered me and it was going to be another 10 years before I was able to decipher that very thing how you get three days and three nights between Good Friday and Easter Sunday morning. Well, the fact of the matter is, Einstein couldn't get three days and three nights between those two uh, pagan holidays of Good Friday when Dagon, the Assyrian fish god, is worshiped, and Easter Sunday when Nimrod's wife, Semiramis, uh, was sent back by the gods uh, from heaven after her death reincarnated as Easter, the bare-breasted fertility goddess who turned a bird into an egg-laying rabbit. There's no way to get three days and three nights, but it took me 10 years before I began to understand how this even became a part of Christianity and part of what is known as the Apostles' Creed. Well, this statement of faith, God is and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The statement is God is, period. Whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, I don't care. God is. He doesn't care whether you believe it or not. It doesn't make any difference to him whatsoever. It doesn't matter whether it's your truth or not your truth. Your truth doesn't matter. We were all born as basically idiots. We knew nothing when we came from the womb. Everything we had to learn. And the first thing is, God is. And then I took people to the scripture. And I would like you to turn to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Without faith, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, the son of David, the wisest man in the world up to a certain point, the wisest man in the world, King Solomon said, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter after he had discussed all of the ramifications of life, all the vanities of life, all the pleasures, all all that money could buy, all that fame and fortune could offer, a man who had anything and everything that he ever wanted in life, a thousand wives, everything and every pleasure, he said, Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Love God and keep his commandments. Love God and keep his commandments. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. How does God want to be pleased? He wants to be loved. He wants to be respected. And the first thing we have to see, without faith, it is impossible to please God for he that comes to God. He that approaches God, he that wants to know the one true God, who wants to understand what this physical conscious experience, what it's all about, he that that approaches God, who wants to know him, must believe that he is. That is the first line of my statement of faith, the first sentence, God is. God is. It is whole and it is complete. It needs nothing else. He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If we diligently seek him, 
he will reward us. If we do not diligently seek him, there is no reward. He does not reciprocate. This we see, this word diligently seek him, is the word that is involved in 2 Timothy 2.15. It says in the King James, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The word study is spudazo, which is be diligent. Be diligent, apply yourself, apply yourself, be diligent to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you want to approach God, if you want to understand him, then we have to be diligent. We have to apply ourselves in every area to to not only study the written word, but to apply it, to hear and obey. That is the essence of Shema, hear and obey. It is the essence of what Moses spoke of, that God would send a prophet in the future, the prophet that would not speak his own words, the prophet who would hear and speak only what he hears from the throne of Almighty God. He will never speak presumptuously. He will never act presumptuously. He will communicate exactly what he is given by the Father, and that prophet we must shema. We must hear and obey. See, this is what drove me to study for more than 50 years, and it took more than 38 years before I was ready to commit to text the chronological gospels because it took an entire lifetime of putting it together, of studying it to where it all fit together and diligently to do this, to rightly divide, to understand the context from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21. And in all these things, I can say that God is, that he rewards those who diligently seek him. And if you believe that God is, because without faith it is impossible to please him, it's impossible to approach him. You can't even come near the meaning of life in understanding what this conscious physical experience is all about, you can't come close to it without faith. That faith is, you've just gotta grab a hold of this one thing. God is, period. End it right there, stop right there. God is. Wash your brain with that reality. God is. And then we're ready to go to the next step. He rewards those who diligently seek him, who are spudazo, who with diligence, they go after him. They're seeking, they're asking, they're knocking. And if you will do that, then the scriptures will unfold. Then we will be able to get to the new Apostles' Creed. I'd like you now to turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10, because this is part of what it means to diligently seek him. Join me again next time.